I love Christmas. The whole Christmas season. The lights, the decorations, all of it. And Christmas music at the Self House, it is on constant repeat. I did a little social um, media experiment and I asked, what's your top three Christmas movies? And I was kind of shocked at some of the answers, especially Home Alone and Elf trending so high on people's lists. But there was a group of people, I don't know who they are, but, but these crazy people think Die Hard is a Christmas movie. My top three Christmas movies are as follows. Scrooge with Albert Finney from 1970. Can't beat it. It's not Christmas until that final scene. And I have seen that movie every year since I can remember. Clark Griswold in The Christmas Vacation. You can't beat it. And finally, the classic is Bing Crosby croons White Christmas. It's just perfect. What about you? Like, what's your favorite three movies? The holiday season is my favorite, and Amy and I decided with all that's going on, like we're going all in this year. It's a big deal. One thing we miss about Christmas, though, is in the hustle and bustle, we miss the audacity of God's plan. Like when we get all the, all the Christmas stuff, we, we miss the impossibility of what Christmas means. I mean, do you understand how inconceivable it is for all these things to happen, let alone one? A virgin gives birth to a baby. Joseph is visited by an angel. Wise men follow a star. Shepherds see angels. God comes in human form. I mean, we're so familiar with the Christmas story that we forget parts of it. They interviewed some children on the street about what they remembered about the Christmas story to some hilarious results. So let's watch that video and see what they know about the Christmas story. Who was Joseph? Joseph is a... Uh... Jesus is stepdad. Um, okay, so the first Christmas was obviously a long time ago. And um, there's these two people, and they were like um, in their bedrooms. And this angel came to um, tell them that they were having a baby. And they didn't have a home, so they had to ride a camel. And the three, king, the three wise kings um, came to the stable, and uh, Mary and um, Mary and Joseph had a baby Jesus. And then what did they do? Um, Santa took baby Jesus to a tree, and then they started to they started to to have like a little feast. And what did the three wise men bring baby Jesus? Um, frankincense and myrrh and gold. <gasps> What's frankincense? Um, What's myrrh? I don't know. What's gold? Gold is gold. <laughs> what did the Virgin Mary do on the first Christmas? Um, she left out cookies for Santa. Did Santa love Mary's cookies? Uh -huh. What kind of cookies were they? Gingerbread. What did Jesus do when he grew up? He uh, went to heaven. What did you do before that? God bless you. He, he, he told everyone that he's, he's a miracle maker. What kind of miracles have you seen? There's only one. It was today. What happened? I, I, I put a, a warm water napkin and I put it on this eye. What did this eye? Which one? Which one? This eye? I, because you see from the side it looks a little swollen? Yeah. It, it's a star. I love that kid at the end. I love it. You know, we, 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 celebrate, uh, we celebrate cultural Christmas, but the truth of what God did is just wild when you think about it. But it does get lost in all the movies and the lights and the music. To truly encounter the joy of Jesus' birth, for me, I had to remember just the impossibility, the incredible divine miracle that Christmas actually is. Now, chances are, as you're listening to this, and it's a Christmas message, there's not much awe. Your mind is not being blown by the fact that these things happen. We've gotten so acquainted by the Christmas story that we're not surprised by it. We've read it, we've seen movies on it, we sing about it. But do you know whose minds were blown by this news? In all the Christmas accounts, there's a lot of drama and surprises and shocking, lots of joy. But in my opinion, the ones who were probably the most blown away, the ones who had their, their minds just blown, were probably the shepherds. Read with me in Luke 2. 
And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now notice they're living out there. This is, this is, a, this is their daily life. This is what they do. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and declaring and singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. I mean, talk about being just surprised by joy. This announcement of joy is delivered and wrapped with a bow in incredible joy. I bring you good news of great joy. This announcement of the Messiah coming. I mean, this was the moment the prophets had foretold. This was the moment that people had hoped for. The one who would bring peace between God and people was here. It amazed, it amazes me he chose those shepherds. That, that's who he made his announcement to. I mean, socially, shepherds, these are not influencers. These are unschooled boys and girls, mainly youths, not adults. And they're nomadic. That means they live moving around, which means they... They're ceremony, ceremonially and religiously unclean. They can't make it back to the temple for their, their sacrifices. They're on the outside of the religious system. I mean, you'd think God would have the angels show up at the temple on a holy day when there are thousands of people worshiping and have them declare the Messiah has come, but no. You'd think that God would have the angels show up to the rabbis and the priests who could truly get the word out to the people, right? But no. I mean, you think God would have the angels break into song in front of the wealthy and the powerful because they can fund a movement. But no. He chose the nobodies of society and blew their minds with joy. He chose to reveal the birth of his son to shepherds on a dark hillside with spotted by sheep in the middle of the night. God surprises them with just his amazing goodness as he announces joy to the world. The coming of Jesus was an explosion of joy, or as O Holy Night puts it, the thrill of hope. You see, Christmas, this season brings us a lot of fun, a lot of joy, but the fact that our Savior came into the world, well, this should be a source of joy daily, which leads me to an interesting question that I want you to answer inside your head. How much joy have you had this year? I know kind of a funny question because it's the most 2020 year ever, right? I mean, we probably have to admit that most of our joy happens when unexpected goodness happens to us. But what happens when unexpected tragedy or unexpected pandemic happens? I mean, Tim Keller preached an amazing sermon this way. He said that we are, as humans, more than anything else on the planet, we crave joy. That we have this joy vacuum inside us that is constantly just needing to be filled. So what do we do? Well, we, we as humans, we pursue things that bring us joy, whatever that would be. Our obsession for those, those, that feeling and those moments of joy, it leads us to pursue things that are good for us, like, like romance. That brings us joy. Friendship brings us joy. Puppies bring us joy. You know, lights on a tree can bring us joy. Toys bring kids joy, and and if we're honest, adults, we have our recreational toys and trinkets as well well that bring us joy. What's amazing to me, though, when when January and February of 2020, we were just habitually pursuing those things in our life that brought us joy, as we always do. We had our joy sources, we had our joy strategies, and we were going after them, and it was a normal part of our day and week, month, to routinely pursue joy. But, but what happens to a person when you remove the joy sources that they depend on from their life? I learned about this the hard way. I think back to what brought me joy in January and February. Just going about my life, just pursuing those things that brought me joy. And most of those things, when the lockdown hit us in March, were unavailable to me. And I have to be honest with you, I I struggled. I struggled with this in March. I'm a social creature. I couldn't go out. I couldn't hang out. 
I couldn't hug it out. I couldn't go to jujitsu and fight it out. I couldn't work out almost every single joy strategy I had outside of my family that I've been relying on all of a sudden was just unplugged. And my heart, my joy vacuum, well, it didn't stop just because there was a lockdown. No, it kept screaming for joy, even though the sources had dried up. So my joy fuel ran low and, and I began to, to get low. And maybe, like, maybe you, like me, you started feeling that darkness rising. The things that at one, one time brought us joy, when they're unavailable, we feel ourselves begin to sink. The pressure of that joy vacuum that's constantly seeking and needing and craving more joy, if it goes without it long enough, it, it begins to fold in on itself. It implodes. A joy implosion can be catastrophic. I mean, as depression rises, well, hope dies. Anxiety roars and, and peace recedes. Impatience with others because well, frustration is right there under the surface, just ready to come out. A joy implosion leads to some dark days, but, but even worse, humans, we make terrible decisions when our joy implodes and we're craving joy from somewhere. We make decisions that last well beyond lockdowns. We can make decisions that affect our health, our relationships, our, our, our kids, our career. In thinking through our, our relationship with joy, I was shocked at how, how powerful the craving for joy is and how the lack of joy and our desire for it, how that calls the shots in our life. We will go create something to get some joy. I was shocked at the ends that we will go through to get just a dose of joy. And I began to see that, that we have an external, we have, I'm sorry, we have an eternal desire for joy. It is eternal. It, it doesn't end. But the world offers temporary fixes of joy. Eternal desire, temporary fix. 2020 was a lesson in how we have cravings for joy that the world will never satisfy. And when some of those habits that we have disappear, what it leaves us with. How much do we rely on the world around us to bring us those fixes of joy. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us this. C.S. Lewis has this quote. A baby feels hunger. Well, then there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. But if I find myself, in myself, a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You see, it's as if our eternal need for joy, eternal need for joy proves there's an eternal God. Temporary joy around us will never satisfy our eternal desire. You were created to have your soul thrilled, your heart filled with, with God's presence, His joy. That's how you were created. You weren't, you weren't meant to go through life striving to, to fill your joy vacuum with, with fixes and fleeting fulfillment. You were created, you were designed to have God's presence fill you and resource you with joy. And my son Elijah, he, he unknowingly put this perfectly. When he, he placed his faith in Christ, he was a little guy, it affected him deeply in that moment. He jolted upright with like a huge smile and his countenance was changed. And we asked him, I said, well, what are you feeling in your heart? And he looked at us and said, a joy explosion. That's how he put it. A joy explosion in his heart, in his soul. When he was baptized, he said the same thing. He said, Mommy, a joy explosion. Something happened there. And in his room, he and I were praying one night this, this year, this fall, and his heart was quickened. And he was filled with the Spirit a new way. And he actually jumped up on his bed. And in astonishment, his, his, his mouth was kind of open before he had a big grin. Daddy, joy explosion. I think the term captures the essence of how God wants our relationship with him to operate. And I want my son to learn. I want him to learn to pursue that, that, that joy explosion and those moments with God that thrill his heart and boon his spirit because he's going to be tempted to grow up. And instead of pursuing God for those joy explosions, he's going to be tempted to, to pursue Legos as a source of joy or then athletics, and then academics, and then relationships, and then career. And, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with getting joy out of those things. 
But if your joy strategy feeds and fixates on those fleeting moments of fulfillment of the world, when any of those things fail, your internal joy is going to fail as well. We feel that absence. And that is what 2020 showed us. It revealed to us the extent that we rely on the world and circumstances to feed us joy. So, so what did I do? What, what did I do to recalibrate my joy strategy during the pandemic? Well, what did you do? What, what, what do we do? The first thing we do is we take an honest look at our current joy strategies. We ask, where am I getting my fixes and my fleeting fulfillment? Where am I getting my joy from that's out there? Like, where have you pivoted to find new joy sources since the other ones have dried up? And we need, to, we need to look at them and ask ourselves, honestly, are they healthy for us? Do they please God? Are they from God? Are they good? Second, we must come to the stark realization that any joy strategy that relies on the outside world as a source will fail. 2020 has showed us what happens when our joy is filled with temporary shakable things around us. And when they fail, we've seen what it does to us. Third, we need to begin to see and understand that we were designed by God to be filled with His joy. That's, that's why we have this, this deep desire. That's why we, we seek joy at every turn, because we were created by God to have a joy explosion. We were created to be in His presence, filled with God's joy. And God's joy is a divine substance that the world can't manufacture. His joy is different than the joy of a little circumstantial sources that we have. We were created to be filled with His joy, not seeking joy externally. If we learn this, the implications are huge. This means if a person um, learns the secret of being filled by God's joy, then no matter what life brings you, no matter what happens out there that's coming toward you, our joy remains buoyant. Our joy doesn't sink. We don't implode. When lockdowns hit, when breakups happen, when, when people die, when dreams die, there's a joy that can still hold you fast. There's a resource of joy that even through the dark night can light your soul. There's no implosion. And I know this, this can sound crazy to a to a joy addict who's finding their sources in the world. How am I joyful when things are bad? The Bible has a lot to say about this. Here's three short ones. James 1, 2, it says, Whenever you face trial or hardship, consider it an opportunity for joy. In fact, another translation says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face a trial of any kind. Romans 5, 3, We find joy in our suffering. Or 1 Peter 1, 6, Be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though we must endure many trials. And again, this can sound too good to be true, but there's a way to live in His joy and goodness that the circumstances around you, well, they just can't touch. Let me tell you about Pastor Stacy here at the, at the orchard. And she did give me permission to share this. She had one of her worst days of 2020 this very week. Well, first of all, she's a children's pastor working at a church during a pandemic. She got into ministry because she loves God and she loves pastoring kids. And what can't she do? She can't pastor kids. And, and then we, we hear that we're going to level red here in Colorado. She works at a house of worship. Like, what will that do to us? Her husband manages a restaurant. Like, what's that going to do to us? But her one bright spot was that her adult kids, her whole family was coming into town to stay with her for Christmas. Like having the whole family under one roof is going to make all this, it's going to find joy amidst all this stuff. And about the same day the level red things happened and all the unknowns of that, Christmas with the kids got canceled. And she said it just devastated her with grief. And it made her livid with all that 2020 was doing. She said it was her worst day. Her attitude was as bad as it had been all year. Joy implosion and all the anger and all the sadness that comes with it. We've all been there. She said she, she didn't know what to do. So she went home. She went in her room, put in her headphones, and she just put on some worship music. And she spent some time in there. She cried. She worshiped. She dealt with the anger. She dealt with the loss. And then she turned her heart toward God and she worshiped. And she said she came out of that room a different person with a different attitude. She wasn't crushed. 
with the weight of disappointment. It was still there, but it wasn't crushing anymore. So, so what really happened there? What really happened? You see, Stacy did the best thing for her heart and her mind and her soul. And it has everything to do with today's sermon. When all the things around her that that gave her joy were failing one after another, just disappointment happening, she went to the one place that doesn't fail. She went to the one place that her spirit was created to find true joy in, no matter what's happening out there. That's worship in God's presence. You know, worship, praising God, this this fights the joy implosion. Worship is, is tuning your heart to heaven. Worship is turning your soul toward a Savior. Worship is focusing on a Father. It's pursuing the presence. Worship is what you were created to do to fill your spirit with God's joy. Now, now you may be new or visiting or wondering, well, what is worship? It seems like a strange thing. And you might have heard Christian radio and wonder how in the world that can bring joy to anyone. Well, here's the secret sauce of worship. Are you ready for this? Uh, Worship has nothing to do with music. Worship has nothing to do with rhythm. Worship is solely about you tuning your heart toward God. It's you turning your soul toward God and and declaring, God, even in this, you are good. When I was going through those dark days of of 2020, when all my joy strategies were failing me, I, I turned to worship. Sometimes I put on music and I would sing but sometimes I found myself just getting alone and I would pray. But I wasn't praying like I normally do, praying for things. Like, God, please help me, help the church, help this stuff. In the middle of the lockdown, I was grieving the loss of all that I hoped would happen with the church, all that I hoped would happen in my life, grieving all those external sources of joy just, just getting shut down. And I began to declare in the midst of that who God was. And I began to declare what he had done for me in the past. And it was hard at first because I was really under the, the, the darkness of this moment. But I remember being there and sitting in that grief and just declaring, God, you are still good. God, you have forgiven me time after time. God, you still love me when I sin. And God, you sent Jesus to die for me. God, you sent your Holy Spirit to live in me. And I just begin to remember the things that he'd done. Like, God, you sent me a wife of, of noble character. And God, I have two miracle children that science can't explain. God, you've given me the desires of my heart here at the orchard. God, you are good even when life is not. And you give peace even in the chaos. And you give joy when there is none available. And so I will worship you and I will declare your goodness. I declared who God was, who he is. My worship was declaring all he had done for me in the past and remembering. You know, Stacy and I did the same thing in different ways, declaring God's goodness, remembering what he had done for us. We turned our hearts to heaven and made declarations of how good God is. Catch this next verse that captures it. 2 Corinthians Corinthians 4.17. Our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Get this, they're small because in light of eternity, 2020 isn't even a speed bump. Our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet these small troubles, they produce for us a glory that outweighs them and will last forever. Like your your temporary 2020 small trouble will produce a glory that will last forever. Verse 18, here we go. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. What are you looking at? That's the question. Am I looking at my troubles or am I fixing my gaze on what is unseen? We turn our gaze, we tune our hearts, we focus on the Father. Worship is choosing to fix our gaze on the unseen God who gives joy in all circumstances. Your joy strategy comes down to the very simple thing. What are you fixing your gaze on? What are you setting your heart towards? Because that, that thing is what you're hoping and trusting is going to come through for you to give you that next bit of joy. But I want to tell you something. That no vaccine, no relationship, 
No politician and no vacation and no other job. And none of those things are going to give you the eternal joy that you actually crave and desire. Your focus reveals where you find your joy. What are you focusing on out there? Hoping if only that will happen. When that happens, then it reveals our sources are out there. The only successful joy strategy on the planet is fixing our gaze on the author of joy. He created our hearts. He created our spirit. He designed you to be quickened by his Holy Spirit. He designed, you to, he designed you to feel a joy explosion when your humanity and his divinity come into contact. That's what happens. A joy explosion. You, we fix our, our gaze. Wherever we fix our gaze, that's what we're worshiping for our joy. And 2020 has revealed a lot about that. C.S. Lewis says this, If you want to get warm, well, go stand by a fire. If you want to get wet, you must get in the water. And if you want joy, you must get close to the one who has it. The verse says, don't look at the troubles you can see now. Instead, fix your gaze on the things that cannot be seen. Whether it's like Stacy worshiping to music that focuses your heart, maybe that's what you do. Or maybe you have a prayer journal where you write down your praises and all that God has done to fix your gaze. Or perhaps like me, it's declaring God's goodness and the benefits and how he's moved in your life. Whatever it is that helps you fix your gaze on God, we need to move back to our original design and worship him. And in those moments of worship, of declaring even in the bad that he is good, we're resourced by peace that transcends this world. When was the last time you had a joy explosion of feeling your heart quickened by the Spirit of God? When was the last time? Maybe you haven't yet, but you were designed to. Here's a daily practice that could transform your life to to, to finding these moments. It's each day, write down, like two things maybe, that you love about God. It's going to be easy at first. But as you go through this, you're, you're finding and seeing and seeking new ways to, to, that, you, that you love God, things you love about him. Or, and then write down two things that he has done for you, remembering what he has done for you in the past, remembering how he has moved in your life already. Two things you love about him and two things that he has done for you. This isn't rocket science. This, this isn't rocket science, but it's soul-sustaining. It's, it's life-changing. It's heart-healing. It's mind-blowing agreement with how you were designed to live to be filled with eternal joy, not temporary joy. You were created to worship. You were created to be filled with joy in God's presence. So, start daily declaring God's benefits. Remember what God has done for you. Begin to declare every day what you love about God, and, and no matter how dark it gets, declare that He is good, and let that bring you joy. It's been a hard year. A lot has been revealed about our faith and our hope and our joy and our love. We've been stretched. We've been pressed. So let's pray a prayer together. If, put your hand over your heart and pray this with me. Just repeat after me. Say, say, God of joy, I admit that I have sought joy in this world. Please forgive me. I want to be filled with your joy. Right now, quicken my heart. Just take a deep breath. Fill me with your spirit in a new way. Teach me to worship you daily. I fix my gaze on you. In Jesus' name, amen. We can find joy from heaven in the midst of chaos, pandemic, politics, whatever else life brings. And I want to end by blessing you with the words from Romans 15, 13. May this be a blessing for you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him.
In other words, as you, you look to him, as you place your heart in him and look, look to him for joy, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be true in your life. Orchard, I love you and I'm praying for you. Love God, love people.